Hey guys, we are here. We're just going to go over a few things about the spread of Islam. Um, ultimately, we want to understand why it spread so quickly, which we kind of looked over today. Um, and then we're going to look ultimately at the different transitions that happened within the Islamic faith, especially key transitions between leaders. So we're going to look at Muhammad and what happened after his death, and then moving into the different caliphates. So that's going to be kind of important as we start this off. So the first thing we want to look at as we go through this is we want to understand um, the spread of Islam during Muhammad's life. If you're looking at this picture here, you'll see um, kind of in this region, in this color pink, um, you'll see that during uh, Muhammad's life, we're really going to have Islam spread within this region. And so we want to ultimately understand how that happened and how we got from this original picture into ultimately this much larger one. So first of all, a key term that's important to understand and know is Dar al-Islam, um, which translates to mean the house of Islam, but it really means more than that. It really is kind of the realm of submission to God, this realm of peace. This where Islam can be practiced, um, where it is kind of state controlled and allowed. Um, so basically anywhere where a majority of the people would be Muslims and they would have the ability to worship freely um, would be known as Dar al-Islam. Now when we're looking at this and we've talked about this already we want to understand ultimately the Ummah and when we combine these ideas together the Ummah or the community of believers and understanding Dar al-Islam um, the belief is very strong that the Ummah does not fight with each other and so that there is safety or peace within Dar al-Islam. And so if you are within the community, um, you don't really have to be worrying about people stabbing you in the back or working for protection um, or those kind of what used to be clan tribes um, kind of fighting over power. Um, that's not necessarily the case anymore. And so the Uma and the community of believers ultimately uh, protects and guards Dar al-Islam. Now, what we see is, as we kind of get towards the end of Muhammad's life, we see that uh, he and other Muslims return to Mecca. Uh, when they return to Mecca, they destroy the idols that are in the Kaaba, and then he eventually is going to give his final sermon. And it's really interesting as we look at his final sermon and the things that he talked about, because uh, they're not necessarily the things that we would think um, that Muhammad would necessarily preach about. But I think this is one of those key ways that stereotypes and other things get in the way of the teaching of what he is. So when we're looking um, when he, he really gave this final sermon, um, he basically told all the people that were there um, that they need to regard life and property of every Muslim as sacred, ultimately to respect the life of people including slaves, and to acknowledge that women had rights over men just as men had rights over women, which is really unique because it's not something that we think of when we think of Islam. And then ultimately to recognize that among Muslims, no one stood higher or lower than anyone else except in virtue. Uh, he also said that the last, he was the last of God's messengers and that after him, no further revelation would come to humanity. So as we kind of talked about before, that he was the last messenger, the last prophet. Um, he later fell ill and then he passed away um, sometime later. But as we see here... Um, this is really key to understanding this and understanding the person of who Muhammad was. And so after his death, kind of the key question that needed to be answered was who takes over leading the Ummah, the community of believers, now? Now they knew it wouldn't be a king, and they also knew it would be a messenger of Allah. And so they were trying to figure what this is, and so in kind of the confusion and the mess, because they didn't necessarily have a plan um, prior to uh, Muhammad's death. Uh, this was something they had to decide kind of on the fly, if you will. And so what they did is they created a position called the Caliph. Now the Caliph is the deputy or leader of the Ummah um, after, as we just said, Muhammad's death. And this person, um, like we said, was not necessarily a king. Uh, and he wasn't a messenger of Allah. 
Um, but ultimately, he would be the deputy or the person that's leading the Uma. Um, and so this is something that they had not discussed prior, and so this is kind of where they were at and something they did. And so they then, after the death of Muhammad, uh, elected or kind of announced who the first caliph would be. And his name was Abu Bakr, and he was chosen. And this really began what we know as the rightly guided caliphs. So there's going to be four of them. Now, when this happened, there were people that kind of gathered after the death of Muhammad to try to figure out who would be this caliph, this deputy. And when they made this decision for Abu Bakr, um, Ali, who was related um, to Muhammad, uh, many thought that he would necessarily, he would be the one that would take over. Um, because Muhammad had basically raised him like a son. Um, and so we see that Ali was about 30 years younger than Muhammad, um, which was very different kind of if you're thinking about the tribal culture that was happening in the Arabian Peninsula um, that would not be normal for someone so young to take control. Um, but we do see, on, when we kind of understand that Ali had moved in with uh, Muhammad again and his wife Khadijah, and so they had, he'd really been really close to them. And the only reason he wasn't around when they picked out Abu Bakr is he was actually tending to the dead body of Muhammad. Um, he also, when we're looking at Ali and why many people thought he would be the first caliph, um, is because not only was he practically like a son to Muhammad, um, he was actually the first male after Khadijah, Muhammad's wife, to accept Islam. So really he was the first male Muslim um, besides Muhammad. And so, um, kind of a big deal. And so, uh, he had even at different times when people were trying to kill Muhammad, um, he was the one, Ali, who wrapped himself up in the Prophet's blankets and risked taking a knife um, for Muhammad um, when people had been coming to try to eliminate him throughout his life. So this was really kind of a big deal when they elected or chose Abu Bakr for the first rightly guided Caliph. And so as we start this kind of age, it's kind of important to understand this. And this is going to cause a rift as we kind of move forward. Um, so as we kind of look at this next part, conquest and political support, we're understanding the question of like, why did Islam spread? Really, you have to understand and look at conquest, but not necessarily conquest to convert people, but conquest as the Islamic empire expanded, just like when we're looking at the Roman empire expanding or other empires like the Persian Empire expanding. Um, we see that the Islamic Empire is going to expand, and because of that, more people are going to convert um, solely because it's the state government, and we're going to look a little bit at that. So as we were just talking about with the rightly guided caliphs, this is kind of from the period of 632 to 661, and you can see how much land they kind of move forward on. And so Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali are going to be our four rightly guided caliphs. And I just want to go a little bit into those real quickly just because some of these things are kind of important for us to understand um, some modern day context about this. So after Abu Bakr, the second caliph was Omar. And he really built the empire significantly during his lifetime. Um, he directed the Ummah for over 10 years. And one of the things that he had really focused on was, again, um, really building that empire to basically even bigger than what the Roman Empire was, um, kind of in its heyday. And so Omar was really big. He was kind of um, played this both spiritual and military role, which is a little bit unique. And then we have this idea of this war of conquest or jihad that came about um, during Omar's rule. Um, and basically, it's kind of interesting because we've talked about jihad um, meaning more about like a struggle or striving and this internal struggle. Um, but when we're looking here, uh, he Omar really took the word to mean more um, explicitly uh, to this kind of war of conquest. And so as we're looking at that, jihad actually doesn't, jihad is fighting, if you will, doesn't show up in the Quran um, but they do talk a little bit about self-defense. And so this is where it kind of gets a little uh, interesting or confusing in some ways because um, Omar is the first one that really turns what Muhammad did and makes it a little bit different um, in that he desired to expand Dar al-Islam, the realm of peace. 
um, and basically in to push back the realm of war, which would be um, the opposite of Dar al Islam. And so they depicted basically Islam as this oasis of brotherhood and peace. Um, and outside of that was this universe of chaos and hatred. Um, and anything a person did to expand Dar al Islam constituted an action in the cause of peace. And so it would be seen as okay or acceptable. And so we kind of see this first essence of jihad, this war of conquest that kind of came about. But it was after the death of Muhammad, and I think that's important for us to really understand. Something else that Omar did within his life um, is he was, uh, although he never like made people convert, kind of by the sword or as people kind of said that, um, we see that he did enact something um, which was this really kind of a special poll tax known as the jizya. And what it basically meant is it, if you were not Muslim, but you would be people of the book, if you will, if you were Jewish or Christian, you could pay this special poll tax, um, and you could live within the Islamic empire, and you'd be all right. Now, the, what's really kind of interesting, especially as we're kind of getting closer to the Byzantine empire, um, some people uh, found that this was actually good news because it would be oftentimes less taxes than they had been paying to the Byzantines. And so... Um, that kind of played a role in this as well. But for the most part, this idea of lower taxes and greater religious freedom um, really struck a lot of Christians as a good deal. And so living within the Islamic Empire wasn't that big of a deal. And so they didn't really push back on the Islamic powers during that time. And so by the time that Omar had died, and he had really focused on these different things, basically... Uh, Islamic rule covered over 2 million square miles, so it's significantly bigger. He really pushed this to a much larger size than it was before. Um, some other things that maybe aren't always uh, the greatest marks that he left on history, um, founding the ulama is totally fine as the scholars that really studied into the Quran and studied into other texts, and so we see this as well. Um, but another thing that was uh, something that he focused on, and uh, he really had really stern measures against um, adultery. Um, and so he started mandating stoning for adultery, which again is not mentioned in the Quran. Um, it does kind of, if you look back into uh, the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, there is some um, mention of stoning people who are caught in adultery. But just so you kind of understand, uh, this was something that kind of came about under Omar. He really uh, regulated the roles of men and women much more than had been during Muhammad's life. Remember again, uh, Muhammad's wife Khadija was uh, very powerful, um, and women had um, a lot more rights. It was a universal faith, and women were accepted. And so I think that's kind of important um, to understand and see these differences as they are coming about. If we're going to go then, um, after the death of Omar, we're going to go to Uthman. Um, he kind of had a rocky turn, but ultimately just something key to remember as we're looking at him is he's going to be part of the Umayyad clan that's going to come back up in a few minutes. And then the fourth rightly guided caliph is going to be Ali. Now Ali is what we talked about before, the one that stood up for Muhammad. Um, he's like family because he is family. Um, he had been passed over now three times to become um, appointed as caliph. But he was blood relation, and many kind of said that he was the keeper of the inner flame. Um, and so he took over and ruled for a period of time. Uh, he was very blunt in kind of his rulership as we talk about him ruling. Um, he said kind of had this stern belief that he would bring back um, what Muhammad wanted to happen um, kind of after his death the whole time. And so we start developing these differences um, between different sects of Islam. And we can really kind of trace them back to, again, Ali versus the other rightly guided caliphs. So just some important things to remember as we're looking at this time period. Now, um, one of those big differences is coming into effect um, when you're looking at the difference between someone who's a Sunni Muslim and a Shia or Shiite Muslim. Um, the Sunni Muslims are going to be people who, uh, as we've seen um, with Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman, we're going to see that the leader was selected from the community. Um, it was 
the people picked who had the best character to lead. Um, these people then also really focused on that religious authority came from religious scholars, the ulama. Um, ultimately, in the world, even today, the majority of people are Sunni Muslims. And we see that they hold kind of a majority, especially, or kind of like a lot of people who are Sunni Muslims live within Egypt and Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Southeast Asia, China, and then Africa. Whereas Shia Muslims are different. Um, this really goes back to this idea that Ali really should have been the first caliph um, because leader should really come from the bloodline of Muhammad. Um, they focus largely on imams, which are the people that have this religious authority. They're infallible. They interpret revelation still today. Imams was just technically a term for someone who leads prayer, but um, it kind of morphed into something more if you're from the Shia sect. Um, they are the minority of Muslims today, and you'll see this mostly in Iran and Iraq. So just so you kind of understand the differences between it, but this really goes all the way back again to who they believe should have been the first rightly guided caliph, the first caliph after the death of Muhammad. Um, and so after the death of Ali, after his assassination, we see the rise of the Umayyad dynasty. This is going to last from 661 to 750. It will be the largest Islamic empire. This is the one that's going to reach all the way up into Spain and is even kind of further east in the Middle East and into uh, kind of even South Asia. Now, they're going to be prominent merchant class. Um, so we kind of see the rise of the merchants once again. And they're going to move the capital in the center of the Umayyad dynasty um, away from Medina and away from Mecca to Damascus, which was a trading city in Syria, ultimately. Now, there's something that's very unique about the Umayyad dynasty is that there was really a higher status for Arab Muslims, people who are from the Arabian Peninsula, versus other people that may have converted in northern Africa, uh, people from other areas in the Middle East, people from, and as we got closer uh, to Anatolia. And so ultimately, if you were from the Arabian Peninsula, that was higher class. Again, we see this jizya was still in effect, this tax, this poll tax on people who are not Muslim. And then we're ultimately going to see this tension or rift that happens between Arab and non-Arab, rich and poor, people who are merchants, people who are not. So just be aware of those kind of distinctions, but understand Umayyad is the one that is the largest, and this kind of intersects with some of the other things that we've been learning. Um, as they pushed into Spain, we know that at the Battle of Tours, and Charles Martel pushing them back, the hammer, if you will. Um, that's where we're going to see these two worlds kind of collide, but just so you kind of get the chronology down. After the Umayyad dynasty, we're going to see the Abbasid dynasty from 750 to 1258. Um, they are going to overthrow the Umayyad empire, and then they're going to move the capital once again, um, and the capital will be moved to Baghdad in modern-day Iraq. Now, this is really interesting, um, mostly because we don't necessarily picture Iraq being... Um, kind of the center, again, of civilization, but it really was during this time, um, especially when we understand the context of uh, what was happening in Europe, and there was not a lot going on in Europe. Um, and so Baghdad was a huge cultural center. Um, and we also see that there is, we're moving closer to what used to be the Persian Empire, and what was conquered um, by people who were Islamic. We're seeing that the Persian influence really kind of came through in the Abbasid dynasty their language, their culture, their bureaucracy or administrative systems. Um, they eliminated that special favor for Arab Muslims and really kind of went back to, as we kind of talked about in the beginning, that the Ummah is ultimately the body of believers, this community of believers, regardless of kind of where you're from and your ethnic background. The Abbasids really had an intellectual focus, and Baghdad really became the center of that. And again, this focus on the ulama, these scholars who set out uh, to understand really the Quran, and then they ultimately in time developed Sharia law, um, which we'll talk more about in time, but just so that you're familiar with that, with the Abbasid. So that was one reason why it spread, and we really understand kind of the political makeup of these Islamic empires and how that spread Islam on the grand scheme. The second reason that it spread, uh, we really want to look, and we saw this a little bit in the DBQ documents, is understanding which what role trade played in this. And so you have to understand, especially in the background just of the formation of Islam, that there is such a merchant background. 
um, even looking once again at Muhammad. Um, we also know that this is a religion that accepted or was friendly towards trade. We know that Mecca was kind of a crossroads of trade, both over land and on sea routes, as well as we look at the Red Sea and also into the Persian Gulf. Um, it also connected existing Silk Road networks, which ultimately um, led to the diffusion of goods and religion and ideas. So this is a really big idea as we see people are traveling and trading and bringing with them not only those goods, but those religious beliefs as well. And then ultimately we're going to see the role of the Hajj. As one of the five pillars of Islam, we see that people um, have to take this pilgrimage if they're able to do so. And so people are going to be moving about um, and taking this pilgrimage ultimately to Mecca. Um, but as we see, they're going to go back to where they came from. And we'll look at different stories of people that made the Hajj and kind of how that also assisted in the spreading of Islamic beliefs. And then the third reason that we really ultimately see Islam spread so much is because of personal conversions. There's a cultural identity for those that kind of belonged within the Islamic empires and they um, bought in and agreed with and found kind of their religious beliefs in that. Um, there are some other people that converted to avoid the tax that we talked about. Um, and a lot of people also that converted that a lot of this really sounded familiar and it was kind of familiar basics of faith that was not so entirely different, especially for those other beliefs that were monotheistic like Judaism or Christianity. And so it was easy for some people to convert because it didn't feel like something that was really different than what they had maybe been experiencing before. And so these kind of combinations we see bring about people um, who don't have a problem with converting. And so these three big reasons, we see the political control and conquest, we understand trade, and we understand ultimately that as a universal religion, one that accepts other people, that there's lots of personal conversions would ultimately lead to the spread of Islam. Now the last thing, we just kind of want to understand some of the historical impacts of this spread, and we'll talk again more about this in this unit, and your textbook covers this as well. But we also ultimately see the House of Wisdom arise in Baghdad. We're going to see this development of algebra kind of based on some of the Hindu um, early beginnings. We talked about this way back to the Gupta and the concept of zero. And we're going to see math and kind of this learning really, really become a big deal, especially in the city of Baghdad. They're going to build on Greek and Indian medical knowledge. This is why when we talk about the Crusades, um, that Muslim fighters are going to be light years ahead of those from Europe and kind of their medical knowledge. They're going to create the first hospitals in the Islamic world. They're going to focus on astronomy and science and philosophy, mathematics and law. And so we see a lot of developments that are happening while Europe is kind of in quote unquote the dark ages. We see that within the Islamic world that they're moving forward and there's tons of innovations. And so um, hopefully that this was helpful in trying to help kind of piece together the story of not only some of those uh, transitions that happened within um, the Ummah, if you will, um, but also ultimately why Islam spread. So hopefully you get some good notes and that helps you understand more fully how Islam spread. Have a good one.